let's let's um let's change the tempo. We're going to yeah. talk about um, uh, a thriller from uh, 893, Falling Down, directed by Joel Schumacher. Right. I think uh, it was controversial on its release because I think it was intending to be deliberately provocative. Um, for its, it, it's about a white collar guy who goes on the rampage, becomes a vigilante. But you've chosen, explain why you've chosen this particular scene for us. Well, I th I've thought of falling down uh, recently because I think uh, it was a precursor of a kind of a feeling of alienation and resentment that we're seeing acted out uh, today. Uh, this is 25 years ago, but uh, already this was in the wake of the uh, f collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, uh, funding in Southern California for uh, aerospace had collapsed, and this is a guy who had worked in the defense industry, so-called defense industry. Um, and. Uh, I also, and, and I, I just think it's a very interesting film that doesn't get, uh, I don't hear a lot about it. I mean, I hear about others of, other of my films but more than I hear about this one. But I, I picked this in particular because uh, it felt, uh, sometimes editors are considered to be people who come in and repair things that have been done wrong where they come in and they save the day or, you know, the, by their invention, they, they, um, they fix something that's not working. But in this particular case, I felt that everyone had done their job really well. The camera work is really excellent. The performances are great. And um, everyone was on the top of their game. Um, but I felt that even in a situation like this, there is room for an editor to make a contribution. So, um, and it also reflected um, my sensibility in terms of music and dance in an odd way. It was, maybe it's just me. Uh, maybe no one will see it but me. But um, I just, you know, it's a very tough scene. And I should give a warning to people that there is some very offensive racist language in the scene. So if you find that's going to be disturbing to you, uh, maybe you should leave now or something. I, but. It, um, I just wanted to give warning to that. I, um, I, I found it a very powerful scene. Sure. Let's, 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 um, let's have a look. And it's very dark. It's very bleak, yeah. Um, I want to move straight from falling down into another prime example of, uh, of building tension, uh, again, without dialogue. It's a, a classic scene from Mission Impossible. Right. Um, the break-in into the CIA. I'm sure we've all seen this probably um, uh, several times, but could you give us some insight, Paul, into how this presented itself to you? Well, uh, it's a film directed by Brian De Palma, who's famous for his set pieces, and this is one of his best. It, uh, it's an elaborate um, break-in into the CIA, and um, time didn't allow to for, for the whole um, setup. The, uh, the scene involves um, an operative in the CIA <coughs> who is in charge of a very secure um, computer where a uh, certain list that um, Ethan Hunt is after uh, is located. And they need to um, get the guy who works in that room out of it so that Hunt can break in. And they. Um, they put a, uh, they poison his coffee to make him ill, and they plant a locator device on his back without his knowing it. So they're able to trace his movements around, and while he's um, getting ill in the men's room, they're breaking into the secret facility. So there are a number of elements to increase the tension here. The um, facility has a, se a sensitive floor. Nothing can touch the floor. Um, there are also uh, thermometers that measure the temperature in the room. If the thermometer goes up too high, it'll set off the alarm. And if they make too much noise, it'll set off the alarm. So you have the tension of not making any noise, not raising the temperature too much, not touching the floor, and getting it done before the 
operative comes back. So these are all the elements of tension in this scene. Let's see it. So people are still gasping and laughing at the right moments there, Paul. Yes, it must be yes. very satisfying. I guess. Yes, it is. Um, so with, with that in mind, I'd be interested to uh, listen to the reaction to the next clip, which is um, from what is now a classic cult comedy. Um, at its time, it was a huge hit, but uh, a lot of comedy doesn't last the test of time, and Ferris Bueller's Day Off certainly does that. So um, introduce this scene for us, and uh, let's see what, what effect it has. Um. I'm not sure how to introduce it. Uh, I know that when I was offered the script, I read it, I thought it was really funny, and I said, you're going to change the title, right? You're not, you're not going with this title. You know, that's, that's a temporary title, right? So no, they never changed it. So uh, Ferris and Bueller were the names of streets in a suburban town near Chicago where John Hughes lived. Um, Hughes was tremendous talent who uh, uh, really extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily gifted writer and uh, had a unique sense of humor. And um, uh, this scene is pretty much self-explanatory. I did manage to um, pay a small homage to Bernard Herrmann in the scene, you'll see. Well, let's look at it. Just before we yes. do, did, did, yes. this, did this scene also remind you of the falling down sequence? You mentioned that to me, like how it was cut well, or the tempo or something, and I'm just intrigued by that. Well, the kind of the rhythmic build in in uh, at the end of the falling down sequence sort of reminds me of elements of this scene as well. Um, but again, maybe it's just in my mind. Yeah. Okay. So the intention there is pretty clear, I think, from the script. It's a, it's a, it's a teen comedy. It's slapstick. Yeah. Um, what happens when you get given a script which is uh, more subtle uh, in terms of comedy? Uh, maybe it's black comedy like Steel Magnolias. How do you, how do you balance something which might be you know, not, not suitable for... Maybe, maybe it's uh, maudlin or over the top. How do you get that balance right? Right. Well, you know, we don't have control over the material, although I've been very lucky to have worked on... Uh, pictures with wonderful material. Um, the reason I chose this this particular um, clip, um, I think it's a wonderful scene from the film. Um, and to understand, well, here's the story that goes with this clip. It's it's not. It's not to demonstrate any particular principle or anything. Uh, if anyone's disappointed, I'm sorry. Um, no, the reason I chose this was that the year uh, before uh, Herbert shot Steel Magnolias, it was our fourth film together. Um, his wife of many years, Nora Kay, had died. And uh, he was still... Um, mourning her, and I had lost a friend, a young woman who died in her 30s uh, earlier that year, and I was mourning her, and as the film was shot, this sequence came in, and I looked at the dailies, and I cried all the way through them, and um, I thought, uh, I, I, I can't deal with this just yet, so I, I'll, I'll cut this later. So I put it on the shelf, and the film kept coming in, and then eventually I cut everything else, and I couldn't avoid it any longer. So I had to cut, and it was sitting on this shelf like this radioactive block of material, and I finally girded myself, and I sat down, and I would watch the, the takes, and I would say, well, does this one make me cry harder than this one? Which one makes me cry the hardest? You know, and uh, to really uh, give a, a scene like this, you know, what it deserves, you have to open yourself up emotionally and feel what the audience is going to feel. And 
it's it's very you know it was very painful and um, I got through it and I I got through the cut and I and I didn't go back I just I said well that's it I've done it and I put it in the film and then in the course of finishing the film Herbert himself didn't want to go digging through the material and finding out which was the more painful scene. Does this hurt more? Does this hurt more? You know. So essentially, uh, this scene which you're about to see is my first cut, and it it's the way I cut it. The, you know, it was just I, I I couldn't deal with it anymore. So anyway, the first cut wound up in in the final cut, and this is an example. Okay. Let's see um, Still Magnolias from uh, 1989. No, I, I, before you begin, I just want to explain that uh, in the film, uh, if you haven't seen it, Julia Roberts has died um, as a young woman, and um, Sally Fields is playing her mother, and the women in her life have come to help her in this difficult time, and um, Daryl Hannah is a very religious person, and um, tries to tell her that, you know, that Julia's in a better place now, and uh, Sally's not having that. So let's, let's watch. Okay. So uh, that's terrific. We, we, we've come Gets to me the every end. time. It, we, we, we've come to the end of our, our um, presentation today. Um, Paul's given us some fabulous insight into uh, uh, only a portion of his movies. Um, but it would be it would be remiss if we if we didn't um, part with uh, at least some mention of uh, the film for which he is most revered. And um, so, could you talk us through um, a date movie from two thousand five? 